Welcome to today's program, Patient Care Team Communication, How Can the Survivor Prepare to Manage a Lifetime of Care? Brought to you by the National Coalition for Cancer Survivorship. My name is Eric, and it is my pleasure to be your moderator for today's session. For technical assistance, send an email to canceradvocacy at compartners.com or send a message in the chat box. Today's program is scheduled for 90 minutes and includes a question and answer segment. Please note that today's session is being recorded and all participant lines will be muted during the session. If you need assistance at any time during the program, please select star zero and the operator will assist you. During our designated Q&A break at the end of the discussion, you may ask a question by selecting star one on your telephone keypad or by typing your question in the chat box area located on the lower left corner of your screen. These instructions will be repeated later in the program. To interact with the presenters, you may submit a question at any time by using the chat feature located on the lower left corner of your screen. Your questions will not be viewable by other attendees. Today's program will also feature polling questions during the presentation. When a poll is displayed during the presentation, simply click on the box next to the answer that applies to you. If you look to the left of your screen, you will notice the links area where you will find resources related to today's program. If you would like a copy of the presentation, click on presentation slides to open and print a copy of the slides. And now it is my pleasure to introduce today's first speaker, Shelley Fuld Nasso, CEO of NCCF. Shelley, welcome to the program. Please begin. Thank you, Eric. And I want to thank all of you for joining us today for this presentation. Um, we, um, we are looking forward to a wonderful presentation by Dr. Deb Mayer. And first, I just want to talk for a couple of minutes a little bit about NCCS and about our Cancer Policy Advocate Training Program before I turn it over to Dr. Mayer. So at NCCS, our mission is to advocate for quality cancer care for all people touched by cancer. And one of our key public policy priorities is to ensure that every cancer patient has access to cancer care planning and coordination services. We believe that ensuring quality cancer care is complex, and there are many areas for opportunity and policy action. One important gap in, is in treatment decision making and coordination of the multiple facets of cancer care. So to address this goal, we have, to this gap, we have a goal to ensure ca cancer care planning and coordination services for all cancer patients. And we believe this means um, a shared decision-making process and planning process at the beginning of di when a patient is diagnosed and setting a treatment plan, when there's a change in the diagnosis or change in the treatment plan, and at the transition to survivorship. So our, our discussion today is going to focus uh, more on survivorship and that doctor-patient communication. This year marks the second year of our Cancer Policy Advocate Training Program, um, which is uh, a, a series of three webinars and an in-person training. Um, this year we will have an in-person training in, in Washington, D.C., June 25th through 26th. And if you're interested, you can email Kelsey Napodi to find out more about it. Um, and our training this year in person is going to focus really on these survivorship issues. And, and that's why we thought this topic would be a very um, important introduction to the issue. So we will be talking about the late and long-term effects recent research findings on the effects for cancer patients throughout their survivorship. We'll be talking about survivorship care plans and some of the workforce challenges, and how that new value-based cancer care payment systems may or may not foster better survivorship care. And then finally, we'll be talking about disparities in survivorship care. So in addition to the, today's webinar, we will have two more webinars in the series and then in-person training June 25th to 26th. We um, have limited spots in our in-person training, so if you are interested, please contact Kelsey, and, and um, we have about 50 slots for in-person attendees. Um, and we do have some scholarships available for travel because we want to ensure that we have a, a broad range of cancer survivors and advocates from around the country participating. Some of you participated last year, and we were very pleased with the group that we had, and we look forward to um, our training again this year. We do have different topics than last year, so if you had participated in the past, you would be eligible to participate again. And finally, uh, you can join the conversation on Twitter with the hashtag CPAT15, and our um, Twitter handle is Cancer Advocacy. 
So I'm pleased to and honored to introduce Dr. Deborah Mayer as our featured presenter today. She is an advanced practice oncology nurse who has consulted with organizations on issues to improve cancer care. And she has over 30 years of cancer nursing practice, education, research, and management experience. She is the director of cancer survivorship at the University of North Carolina Lineberger Cancer Center. And we are very honored to have her join us today. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Dr. Mayer. Thank you very much, and welcome, everybody. I'm glad to see so many people in attendance, and I'm happy to talk about my um, soapbox issues of how do we promote survivorship care in the U.S. Um, some of you will be part of this bigger pro training program, and some of you will only be participating today, um, but I hope the slides are helpful um, for whoever the participant is. I've been asked to speak about communication and how to help the survivor prepare to manage a lifetime of care. And that's a huge topic, and I hope we have some good discussion and some questions um, posed or some sharing of experiences as we go along. I will be um, sharing some of my perspectives. I'll share some data from existing research, and then we'll talk about what, um, what we should be striving for in improving survivorship care. So I'm going to review with everybody who's a cancer survivor. Um, we're going to talk about what healthcare team members are involved with cancer survivorship care. And as was um, discussed at the beginning, there's different transitions along the cancer continuum. And while I'm focusing on the transition from end of treatment to survivor, ongoing survivorship care, I will be talking a little bit about some of the other transitions. And then the role of communication to facilitate this care and then a little bit about some of the resources that are available for that. And as you know from the National Coalition for Cancer Survivorship, which was established in 1986, the broad definition of a survivor is an individual who is a cancer survivor from the time of diagnosis throughout the balance of his or her life. It also includes family members, friends, caregivers um, who will share the experience. I'm going to be focusing most of my comments about the cancer survivor themselves who had the cancer. There will be some comments I'll be sharing, you know, focusing on family members, and I will be directing some comments to those of you who are um, healthcare providers on, on the call as well. But that's a very big umbrella, and there's all kinds of survivorship. So here's a listing of a couple of different kinds of survivors, those who cancer, once it's treated, never comes back and they're fine. There are those whose cancer never comes back, but they develop treatment complications. There are those who do fine for a really long time and then their cancer comes back. And then there's who are do fine from this cancer but then go on to develop another cancer either from their predisposition or from their treatment. And then there's those who live with cancer that either never goes in remission or is intermittently coming back and forth. And we know that in cases like ovarian cancer or non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, there are certain diseases that are more prone to that. But because we've made so much progress in cancer care, we also know that people can live with advanced disease for much longer periods of time than they did 20, 30, or 40 years. A lot of the survivorship work that we talk about, especially around survivorship care plans, is focusing on people who ended curative intent. But we do need to remember that there's a whole cohort of people living with advanced cancer who need help in figuring out how to do this and how to get their needs met. Now, there were a couple of good literature reviews thinking about survivorship, and it's anyone who's lived through a potentially deadly or life-altering event. It does not need to be cancer. It could have been Katrina. It could have been Sandy. It could have been um, a crime. It could be any number of things. In our case, we'll be talking about cancer, which most people at time of definition think it's a life-threatening issue, whether that happens or not. It's also a dynamic process. It changes over time. And it usually involves some degree of uncertainty. Nobody can guarantee that the cancer is not going to come back or that they won't have further problems. And so living with that uncertainty adds an edge to things because nobody can tell you for sure what will or won't happen. For most people, it's a life-changing experience. That, that may be subtle or not so subtle, and it may change over time, and we'll talk about that too. And as most cancer survivors will tell you, it's both positive and negative. And one of the most 
tough questions is, would you rather have not had the cancer and not learn those good things or had the cancer and had the silver linings that come along with it? And even given all of that, it really is a filter through the person's individual experience and the experience they've lived through with family and friends. And so we need to understand that filter as we interpret what those needs are with um, the people we're involved with. Now I'm going to use some of the images, and I, and I promote this widely because I just think a picture is worth a thousand words. And the National Coalition for Cancer Survivorship um, partnered with Lilly Oncology on Canvas. And every two years they have a competition for survivors, caregivers, and health professionals. Um, the last one was just from 2014, and you can go online and search Lilly Oncology on campus. But I use the pictures because I think that many times the picture tells so much more um, than what we can convey with words alone. And so we're going to talk about survivorship and how do people live with this, and as this image talks about, living with cancer takes guts. So when we talk about who's on the healthcare team, the patient, survivor, is at the center or should be at the center of the team. Now, it's very popular to talk about patient-centered care. However, in our healthcare system, that's not as easy to receive as it is to talk about. Um, family and friends, uh, the primary care provider, and if the person doesn't have one, they should be getting one. And if they don't have one, oftentimes the oncology team can help the patient find a primary care provider. And um, because there's a lot of non-cancer related issues that need to get addressed, as well as somebody to follow the person over time when they may no longer be followed by the cancer team. And then there's all the people on the cancer team, which includes you know, doctors, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, nurses, nurse navigators, social workers, a whole host of people, and pharmacists. Um, and it depends on where you're being treated as to how many people are on that team, but um, hopefully they are staying connected and we'll talk about the communication issues with primary care. And then there may be other providers that you may need. If you develop lymphedema, it may be a lymphedema therapist, it may be a chaplain, it may be somebody um, helping with return to work issues. So basically the team is as big as you need it to be and no bigger. Now, Steve Taplin has done a whole monograph from NCI around um, uh, care delivery and the complexity of that. And this is just meant to show you how many people may touch the person with cancer over time, from primary prevention from the primary care provider, detection, early detection or screening, um, or workup of somebody who's being diagnosed during treatment, and beyond, and that beyond treatment may go for a, quite for decades, depending on who the person is. And then within each group, there's doctors and nurses and others being involved. So, so the point I want to make from this is twofold. One is it makes care very complex very quickly, and two is it's really hard to keep track of who all these people are. So one of the things that um, may help if you're going to be advocating for um, patients and their family members is um, keeping track of who all these players are and what team they belong to, what their role is, and then how to be in touch with them. Oftentimes when I've talked to patients or during focus groups, we ask, how do you know who to call? And they're like, I call the first person that I have the contact information for, whether they're the right person or not. And oftentimes that's the oncology nurse, and then they help triage where things, um, where to go from there. But you can imagine how confusing this is and how overwhelming this is for somebody to keep track of. So we should think about how we create um, contact list sheets or include that information in treatment plans or survivorship care plans about when and where and who to call. Now the focus of this is around communication. And the National Cancer Institute has a wonderful publication, and if you don't have it, you can go online and download it or order it for free, and it's called Patient-Centered Communication in Cancer Care, Promoting Healing and Reducing Suffering. And I like this slide because they really talk about the multiple um, objectives of communication. 
So it's not just providing information. It's providing, it's communicating to exchange information to help you make decisions. It may help foster relationships. It may help you take care of yourself. It may help you manage the fears and concerns of that, the uncertainty of what's going on. And it may help in dealing with the emotions that come along with dealing with all this. And so all communication doesn't do all of these things, but all communication should do at least one of these things. When we're working with um, survivors and their families, we should be thinking that through. And so one of the questions we should be asking is, does the person have enough information to manage what they're trying to deal with, whether it's taking care of themselves, make a decision, or cope with what they're facing with? But what I hear oftentimes from patients is, I don't even know what to ask. And so the question is, how do you ask questions when you don't know what to ask? And um, I think that's often the role of providers and family members and advocates to help people figure out what questions to ask, not necessarily even to provide all the answers. And that can be very helpful that way. Now, many of you are familiar but I just want to introduce the concept, if you haven't heard about this, about the cancer care continuum. And this looks like a nice straight little line going from prevention and risk reduction, like not smoking, to screening for um, general population screening, like colon cancer or mammography for breast cancer, to diagnosis for somebody who may or may be symptomatic through treatment and then beyond. And that sounds very linear. Um, but in fact, it may or may not be. And this slide, the, the green arrow at the bottom, is showing you that during the diagnosis and treatment, it can feel very acute and intense, and it's very hard to lift up your head and look beyond um, what's immediately happening. The purple arrow here is talking about what should be going on from the time of diagnosis um, throughout the rest of the person's life. And that's what we're struggling to do in today's quote-unquote patient-centered care, which is giving the patient and family the tools they need about to know what's going to happen to them, um, what their resources are, and how to manage and cope with what's going on physically and psychosocially. Now, um, I'm going to be focusing a lot of my comments towards a survivorship transition, but we should recognize that, again, there's transitions at each of these time points. And communication plays an incredibly important part during that transition. So imagine you're referred for your annual mammogram. And then they find something suspicious. And then you're referred for further workup, like an ultrasound. And then they recommend a biopsy. And then it turns out positive, And then you're referred to a surgeon or the breast care team. Um, and then you start going down this path. And it's, it becomes this almost unstoppable process, but at each point along the way, you have to ask, is the primary care provider being kept in the loop and being informed about what's going on? And is the patient um, getting the support they need to move from one transition to the other and know who's, who's being involved in their care in that handoff? So you can see from these arrows, there's a lot of places where transitions in care need to be attended to, and we have a lot to learn from our healthcare counterparts in um, dealing with skilled nursing facilities and dealing with um, gerontology who spend a lot more time and attention looking at transitions in care from hospital to facility, facility back to hospital, that I think we should be studying some of these non-cancer related applications as to what the evidence is to help facilitate transitions in care without um, miscommunication. And I don't think we're as good as we can be with that. If you can read, and you need to go to the original to really appreciate all this, it starts out with life before cancer, chemotherapy, radiation, and this says perseverance, and life after cancer. Each of these islands is surrounded by words, things like fear, friendship, community, or what have you. But it is. It, incredibly detailed with the number of words that are in here, but it also shows that this process is not linear and that it's a journey that um, the analogies have been used in the past, which are similar to being put on a plane 
without your passport and getting off in a country that you don't know the language. And that's another plea for better communication, which is not to speak Onco-speak for those providers who are on, on the call, because we speak a language that amongst ourselves we all know and are comfortable with, but we're expecting people to understand or get the nuances of what it means and not speak in plain English, if I can call it that, to help people really understand what we're saying. Many of you are familiar with this 10-year-old uh, seminal report that was done from the Institute of Medicine. It was very important because it really was one document that talked about many of the issues that people feel um, when they're ending treatment and moving into this more active phase of survivorship. It's called Lost in Transition. And so the book and the 10 recommendations that came out of it were meant to raise awareness about the needs of survivors, both medical and psychosocial. Um, and one of the recommendations was about survivorship care plans ending treatment. But I would like to challenge you to say that it's the back end of the bookend, and that what should also be in there, and which was already mentioned at the very beginning, is that we should also be providing written treatment plans at time of diagnosis. From my own clinical experience of talking to people after treatment ends, when I review their pathology and the treatment, they have many questions that have arose over time, and it's important for them um, to be able to ask those, but I wonder how many of those would be alleviated had we given them a written treatment plan up front, which spells out their diagnosis and spells out the planned care. Now, the summary is a good way to talk about what actually happened, but it's, it's only one end of the bookend if we haven't done the front end of it. Although the Commission on Cancer is only requiring that, I would challenge all of you to say, what do we give our people um, who are diagnosed with cancer at the time of diagnosis in writing, because we all know, um, as far as communication is concerned, how poorly um, people retain information, especially when they're anxious or overwhelmed after being told they have a cancer diagnosis. They also talked about developing evidence-based guidelines for survivorship care, and those are slow in coming, but they are developing. And I would recommend you to look at the survivorship um, guidelines in the national nccn.org um, website, which does update regularly. And we do need better research to have more evidence-based guidelines. Some of them are still consensus-based. And then we also have to refine our quality measures of how we measure all of this so we know how we're doing. Um, and that's, that's happening slowly. Given this report's 10 years old, though, we do know that although we're paying more attention to some of these things, the uptake of the recommendations have been slow and low. Um, the essential components of survivorship care were identified as surveillance for cancer coming back, screening for new cancers, identification and interventions for the consequences of the cancer and its treatment, health promotion strategies. Patients often ask at the end of treatment, now what and what can I do to stay healthy? And then although there is no strong evidence that shared care is the best model of survivorship care, there is data to say that patients who receive shared care by both the primary care provider and the oncologist actually receive better, more co complete care than if they see one or the other. Um, and we don't do this in an intentional, coordinated way, and that's one of the things I'm going to be talking to you about. So since we're talking about how to help a survivor manage a lifetime of care, I've taken each section of the essential components and then put in some questions that I think survivors should be asking and that people can help them advocate for these questions and getting the answers. So for example, what kind of surveillance does somebody need for the cancer coming back or looking for a recurrence? They should be asking, what test should I have? How often should I have them? Who will order them? And when and how I will get the results? We can, you could also ask what will happen if the results are not normal. The who will order them is a very important question around coordination of care. There was one study that showed that patients who had colon cancer had more colonoscopies than they needed 
because they were getting them every year instead of every three years after their first initial one, what that was normal. And so we want to make sure that patients aren't getting over or under tested, which means that we need to know what's supposed to happen, who's going to order it, so that people aren't overdoing it or underdoing it. And if it's the patient who lives in a rural area, they may need to get their mammogram at home and make sure that the primary care provider knows they're the one supposed to order it or that they're going to be coming into the cancer program and that will do that so that they don't need to also order it. Now, some patients you would think, well, why would I get two mammograms? Some patients may say, oh, I just have one, so I don't need this one. But there are other people who may not know how to advocate for the fact that I just had this within the last six months. Do I really need that? And so I think it really helps us advocate for patients to make sure this is very clear because we shouldn't put the burden on them to sort this out. The next component is screening for new cancers. Now, just because a person has one cancer does not mean they're off scot-free from getting another cancer. In fact, if you have one cancer, sometimes it makes you at higher risk for another cancer. For example, recently there was a report for patients who have had bone marrow transplants may be at higher risk for developing melanomas. But on the other hand, they may also be at risk just because they're getting older um, and they're, they're at risk for whatever reason. So we don't have specific screening recommendations for cancer survivors with few exceptions. We recommend that they get the normal, healthy adult screenings. So for example, if I'm following a patient for breast cancer, I would still expect and want to make it clear to the patient and their primary care provider, they should be getting their colonoscopy or whatever other colon cancer screening process they should have. So as we know, um, pap smears, mammograms, um, colon cancer screenings are the three biggest ones, but there may be risk factors, for example, for skin checks or other things that somebody may be due for. I personally use the USPSPS task force recommendations for men or women of the appropriate age to make sure that the, the survivor knows those are the tests they should be getting um, for for other cancers and to make sure that their primary care provider is doing that, and if not, then we should pick up on them. And again, how often should they occur, who will order them, and how will they get the results? Now, they should also be screened for other health promotion things, and again, I use the US PSTF task force recommendations unless there's a reason to use another one for things like cholesterol screening, um, vaccinations, et cetera. The third essential component of survivorship care includes identification and interventions for consequences of cancer and its treatment. Now, a very, very small percentage of patients are diagnosed and treated and at the end of treatment have no further problems. And they're, they're the lucky ones. But most patients have at least one or more problems, and I'll go into them in a few minutes. So I think it's fair question for patients to ask what will my recovery be like? And that includes how long will this fatigue last? Will the numbness and tingling in my fingers go away, et cetera? And so um, I think we need to sort of normalize what will happen so that patients and their families aren't worrying about, is this normal? Is there something wrong? When should I call? And so I think we should do that as best as we know how to, but again, there's not a lot of good data to talk about what recovery patterns exist. The other questions are, if it doesn't go away, will it get better? And then if this is the way it's going to be, what can I do? Is there anything else I can do to help manage that? Being many women with breast cancer, as you can imagine, I see a number of women who have peripheral neuropathies. Um, and that may be just a, a totally go away, or it may be just an annoying residual problem, or it may in fact interfere with somebody's um, vocation. And they may have to change jobs depending on how severe it is. And so these are not insignificant. Um, we need to talk about the impact on the person's functional abilities as well as the rest of their quality of life. The other is then talking about late effects. And we don't know enough about late effects to be able to fully inform people about things that they should be looking for. 
one of the big things that we should be talking about is heart disease because there's data that says that if the person doesn't die from their cancer coming back, heart disease is the second biggest reason for death in cancer survivors. And that may be because heart disease is a leading killer in our society. It may also be that some of the treatments that we give help precipitate um, heart disease as well. So we need to at least forewarn people about potential late effects, um, although there's not good data about what the actual screening should be. And again, I would refer to the NCCN guidelines to look at some of those things. The Children's Oncology Group also has some very good guidelines, most of which are consensus-based. But again, it's a good place to look for how it's being handled in children and, and adult childhood survivors. Again, about prevention is very important at this phase. For example, you don't want people to start smoking, and if they're already smoking, this is a great time to be talking to them about quitting if you haven't already done that at the beginning of treatment. Even with people who have lung cancer, quitting smoking after diagnosis extends life and improves quality of life, so it's never too late to quit smoking. That's very different from the way we thought about it 40 years ago. We thought, well, you know, they have lung cancer, why worry about that now? But we do know that even quitting smoking after improves symptom management and improves quality of life. And then the other issue is who should I call if I develop any of these problems? Now, we follow patients in oncology, sometimes five years, sometimes 10 years, but many of these problems might not develop until 10 or 20 years after treatment's over, and they may or may not be seeing anybody in the oncology community. One of the things they should be aware of is to talk to their providers about their cancer history and their cancer treatment so that this may be something that um, the primary care provider or whoever they're seeing may want to reach out then to their oncology counterpart to talk about, is this a treatment-related problem? And I'll give you a minor, a, a small example is I worked with a pediatric oncologist and one of her patients um, was off in college now and doing well and developed a dry cough and went to the ER and they saw an infiltrate on chest x-ray and they were going to proceed with a biopsy, but this patient insisted that they call the oncologist. And luckily it became apparent from looking at the x-ray that this was in the port area of the film for radiation, and it was probably pulmonary, pulmonary fibrosis. So the patient didn't actually need the biopsy, and the treatment for pulmonary fibrosis was very different than if they thought it was an infectious infiltrate. Um, again, again, we have to educate our patients um, to know who to call and when, and to make sure that everybody on the team knows about this history. And um, another person I know had had significant hip problems. Well you know, making the connection between her child leukemia and heavy steroid juice um, helped explain why her arthritis and actually she had some ne um, necrosis made was more significant than one would expect for her age or her size. Um, and, and that would be considered a late effect, but I'm not sure anybody was connecting dots for her or with her. Another component of survivorship care is health promotion strategies, and patients really want to know what they can do to become or stay healthy or things that they should avoid. Um, and then the other thing to be aware of is what are the resources for programs online or in your community that you can refer them to? Now, many of you know that the Live Strong has partnered with the Y for exercise programs for survivors. Other programs are available in many communities that can help people around nutrition and physical activity. And there's certainly a lot of um, lifestyle changes support, for example, for stopping smoking. And one of the most important things we can do is encourage people to become physically active. And that varies on who the individual is as to what that is, but to start out walking um, at a minimum on a regular basis, and the American Cancer Society has a good set of guidelines for um, physical activity and nutrition during and after treatment. And if you're looking for guidelines or patient-related materials, there's some good ones about that. The other is about controlling sun exposure and moderate alcohol intake, and then again, appropriate um, vaccinations depending on the circumstances. 
So people really may not be thinking about these things at time of diagnosis or early on in the treatment phase, but as treatment ends, these things creep into um, the picture, and we really should be active in encouraging thinking about this and acting on them. And the last part I talked about uh, initially was about shared care, which is um, sort of a shorthand way of talking about how are we going to coordinate care between the cancer team and primary care providers. So some of the things we can have patients ask is how will you keep my primary care provider or my cancer doctor in the loop about how I'm doing it about any of my tests. Um, so with electronic health records, if somebody's within the same system, that may get better. Um, and in fact, we've done focus groups with primary care providers who feel if they're in the same electronic health system, they have a way to keep posted about what's going on with their patients. But if somebody's out of that electronic health system, until we get to higher levels of meaningful use where everybody can cross-talk with each other, um, this is going to be an important aspect. And so we just did some testing with survivorship care plans that we sent through EPIC, our electronic health record, and actually called the primary care provider's office to say, did you receive it? Because when you, when you press these buttons in an electronic health record, you, you don't know what happens. You don't know where it goes. You know where it's supposed to go and what's supposed to happen with it, but you don't know if that really does. And so we called a handful of primary care providers to say, did you receive this, so that when we push that button, we know they got it, which helped us to feel better about it. Another question is, when do I stop seeing my cancer doctors, if and will I? Now, there are certain high-risk patients who may never stop seeing them, people who have had bone marrow transplants or have high-risk or complicated care. But many people who have had cancer and been treated for it should stop seeing their cancer team. And that should happen you know, a certain window, depending on the disease they had and the kind of treatment and how complex it was. One of the things I see in the U.S. healthcare system is we have hung on to people in our cancer programs, in my perspective, way longer than we need to because it's nice to see them for follow-up. It makes them feel better. There's a lot of reasons why that has continued, but I'm going to challenge us to really think, rethink that because as more and more boomers move through and we start creeping up from one and a half million new survivors a year, new, new diagnosis a year up to over two million a year, we're going to have to make room for them in our oncology clinics. And that doesn't mean to discharge people inappropriately, but we should be able to triage people who are low risk back to their primary care providers fairly quickly, intermediate risk for a little bit longer, and then high risk patients maybe keep those for follow up. But we're going to have to change how we do follow up care for people and work with them from almost the time that they're diagnosed so that they understand this is normal and expected. And an analogy that I've used in the past is that you never admit a patient without starting the discharge planning process if you can help it. And we should be thinking about all that at the time of diagnosis and beginning of treatment about how this patient's going to do, where they're going to go, what are their needs going to be when this is all over. And that's very hard because we have our head down in a very acute care and treatment-oriented um, possibilities around what's, what's going on immediately, but we do a disservice to ourselves and to our patients and to their primary care providers by all of a sudden one day arriving at the end of treatment and then say, oh, we'll see you back in three months. An example of that would be somebody who's gotten chemotherapy for colon cancer, they may be on a regimen where they're coming in for treatment every two weeks for six months and seeing the same patients, getting the same infusions at the same time and seeing their nurses and doctors and feel very supported. And after seeing somebody every two weeks for six months to be said, told that we'll see you back in three months, that feels like a really long time to be out there on your own. But I think we need to think about how we can set people up so that they're um, more successful and it's no wonder that people start getting anxious or depressed when treatment ends because the safety net is not there in quite the same way. And then the final question to ask is, how will I know which of my doctors I should go to? And in focus groups with patients with advanced cancer, 
we asked that question, and it was very interesting to see how they differentiated who they went to for what kinds of problems. Part of that was convenience. So if they were seeing their oncologist a lot, they, they hoped that their cancer doctors would do the things like give them their flu shot or renew their hypertension medicine, but um, that may not always be possible. And it may also be that the primary care providers there with a long-standing relationship that can help the patient with decision-making, emotional support, um, et cetera, and that needs to be actively involved. So um, one of the things we may want to do is be clear in our instructions to patients and families about when they should be contacting us. And, th and then the other thing we tested was a message from day one that said you should continue to see your primary care provider for your non-cancer-related care throughout. Now, I know that payment can be an issue with co-pays or what have you, but seeing somebody, it's a way to maintain the relationship. It's a way to maintain um, attention to some of the other comorbid conditions that the patient may have. And we know that on average, uh, older cancer survivor has on average two to three comorbid conditions in addition to their cancer. And so staying partnered with the primary care providers throughout treatment, and especially as treatment ends, is an important part. This is not something we do really well, and so I want you to reflect on how you can help make this better, whether it's thinking about your own practices or how you coach patients and families about what they should be asking. I'm going to briefly discuss survivorship care plans. One of the things that I think has happened with the Institute of Medicine's report is of the 10 recommendations, one of them was around the survivorship care plans, but everybody's jumped on this as the thing we could do because it's a thing we can do. It was meant as a tool to facilitate communication and coordinate care. And unfortunately, it's become focused on filling out a form. And that's not really the intent. Filling out the form is meant to be a tool to facilitate that communication, both with the patient and with the between providers. Um, so, so I'm not going to spend more time, but I'm happy to take any questions about that or how we've been dealing with that. But I also want to talk about the unmet needs of cancer survivors because we do, I think, a decent job at the beginning of educating people about what cancer they have and about their treatment. I'm not sure we're as good about when we see people in follow-up about asking them questions about what they, they have questions about or um, seeing where their needs are, are. And I'm going to share some data about unmet needs and some of the studies that we have of survivors. This was from the Vermont Cancer Registry. And it was interesting because most of these patients were five years or later after their diagnosis and yet most of them had unmet needs that were informational or emotional. And you can see some of the things included side effects after treatment, as well as dealing with some of these other aspects, such as helping with their partners and sexuality, reducing stress and the fear of recurrence. But five years out, to have that many unmet needs makes me wonder what happens at each of the follow-up surveillance visits or visits with the primary care provider, what is being discussed, or are patients able to bring in the questions and concerns that they have for those visits. Now, in another study of American Cancer Society's um, survivorship cohorts of over 1,500 patients, this was cross-sectional of people who were e either out 10, 10, 5, or 2 years from time of diagnosis. And again, they also had many unmet needs, but it wasn't related to time since diagnosis. So many 10-year survivors had a lot of unmet needs. And as you can see, the domains here, some of them were physical, some financial, and a good 20% of them were informational. So no matter how long somebody's been out, if you're seeing them in a follow-up visit, I would leave with a question like, many times people have questions they haven't asked yet or aren't clear about since your diagnosis and treatment. Do you have any that you would like to ask today? And you may be surprised about what comes up. There's another study that looked at survivors two to five years after diagnosis. And as you can see, over 70% of them still had questions about tests 
in their treatment. You would think that up to five years after, a lot of those would be resolved about health promotion, side effects and management, etc. as you can see here. So we should not assume if people are coming in for sort of, as I've heard some of our colleagues talk about well baby visits, where they come in for their checkup to see if their cancers recurred, does not mean that they don't have questions or unmet needs. And we shouldn't assume that just because we're doing a checkup to see if their cancers come back that they don't have other needs that they need to have addressed. So as you can see, this was again in the Vermont um, study that there were questions about access to care. Um, there, these are unmet needs or reporting needs. So over almost 70% said that they felt like they were managing their health together with their team, so that was a need. 64% about screening for recurrence or other cancers, and 62% assurance that your doctors talk to each other. This isn't that we were doing that. It was that they reported this, that they needed this done. And as you can see, for information, providing it in a way that's understandable, talking about what the side effects after treatment, and more about their diagnosis. Oftentimes, people who have been diagnosed end up being the community go-to person in their church or other area. If you, you can ask people who have had a type of cancer when somebody else has been diagnosed, oftentimes they're that go-to person, and it helps to make sure that they're well-informed because they are helping other people in their family and their community about this. And as you can see, also helping manage concerns about recurrence and in talking with others. We do some work on training providers about how to break bad news. We spend no time talking to patients about how, who to tell and how to tell somebody that they have cancer. And I can tell from my own personal experience that can be very difficult to decide who you're going to tell and how you're going to tell them. Um, and I can give you an experience from myself where I was diagnosed and I didn't, it was okay that people knew but I was very clear saying I didn't want to talk about it, but I was going to be out for a while, and when I came back, people were lined up to talk about it. And so it, it was very interesting because it turned out to be the roar shark for everybody else's experience where I heard about somebody's Aunt Betty who had that kind of cancer, et cetera, et cetera. And so we need to think about how we help our patients and survivors talk about their cancer experience and about disclosure, whether they disclose when, where, and to whom. Um, so I think that's something that we've um, not done enough on over time. So this is another one that's very important. It's called the road home. And you may or may not be able to see, but there's words on each of these little islands and the organs like fear and tears um, and, and what have you, and it's worth looking at. But very few people get away unscarred, whether it's physically or psychologically. So when we talk about long-term and late effects, I just want to make sure that we're on the same page. Late effects are something that's unrecognized or hasn't developed until later. Um, that may be heart disease. That becomes heart failure later. It may be cataracts if somebody's had radiation to their head and neck or hypothyroidism if they've had radiation to their neck area. Or it could be long-term effects such as fatigue. Um, that, or the peripheral neuropathies that don't quite go away, that people have to learn how to figure out how to live with. These are the most common long-term issues. Fatigue is a very common problem, and many family members and friends and coworkers don't get the fact that when treatment's over, it's not over. And they, you know, everybody's there to be supportive if they're lucky to have the support during treatment. But people sort of go back to their own worlds when treatment's over when somebody may still be experiencing a significant amount of side effects that may not have totally resolved. And so, again, we need to be careful about how thoroughly we do an assessment in our follow-up visits to make sure that we're addressing some of these issues. We also know, as I previously mentioned, that um, cancer survivors have other comorbidities, some of which we make worse because of our treatment. So, for example, think about prostate or breast cancer where we give hormonal therapy 
and we may be precipitating osteopenia or osteoporosis. We can talk about exercise and vitamin D and calcium intake at the beginning of therapy, but it's also something we should be screening. For people who've had any kind of radiation to, that might cover the neck area, you certainly want to be thinking about hypothyroidism. Um, we can also talk about depression and anxiety. We know about um, cognitive changes, what used to be called chemo brain, but we're finding out a lot more. It may not be really just about chemo. Um, and given our society, many people already have obesity, diabetes, and cardiac disease. And so we need to think about how what we're doing for them may interact with that. So, for example, you're giving highly emetogenic drugs for treatment, and so you're giving patients boluses of steroids. What does that do for their diabetes? Are you working with the primary care provider to adjust what medications they're on? Or you may give them a targeted therapy that may cause hypertension, and they're already on meds for hypertension. So I think this is a good example of where communication with the primary care provider becomes really very important. So when we think about long-term and late effects, we should think about the interactions of all of them together. And this is no one person's responsibility, but all members of the patient's team to think about and to um, assess and evaluate and help manage. So that's all well and good. And that's in an ideal world that we would all do those things. But that doesn't really happen as much as we think it should or would be nice to have happen for the people that we're um, taking care of. And that has to do with a lot of the barriers that are slowly getting better. And I must say that having been an oncology nurse for 40 years, the changes I've seen in the last couple of years relate to the Affordable Care Act and um, the movement towards electronic health records and what have you has changed faster in the last few years than in the first 35 of my career, which makes me hopeful. Maybe by the time I retire, things will even be better. But part of what happens is we have a very fragmented delivery system. So you may get your radiation one place, your surgery another place, your chemotherapy another place. And again, how do we communicate even within the cancer team, never mind with just the primary care provider? Survivorship care currently is not included as a regular part of most training programs in oncology, and it's just starting to be included in medical oncology. I've just re reviewed all the milestones for surgical oncology, radiation oncology, medical oncology, pharmacology in oncology, and I looked at the oncology, certainly in our oncology standards, we certainly address some of that, but survivorship um, doesn't um, take up a lot of the curriculum nor does um, coordination of care and communication. And that's a gap that we need to be closing. We need to figure out how to do that provider-to-provider -provider communication and how to make sure that the survivor is kept in the loop with all of that and empowered to make sure that they're getting the care they need. Part of the issue, though, is the fact that we have few long-term studies of adults with cancer. And NCI has put out a call for cohort studies that will do this, and they're just reviewing applications. So the data from that may not mature for another five to 10 years. And we're going to have to be making decisions about how to take care of um, survivors without that data. But as we get more information, um, we can refine it and make it more evidence-based. There are many resources. That's the good news. If you know where to look and how to look and you have access to the computer and the Internet, which we know not all of our survivors do. So I'm just going to review a few of these. Um, and mo many of these you'll already be familiar with, but just in case. Um, one is obviously the sponsor of this talk, the National Coalition for Cancer Survivorship. And as you can see um, from their their toolbar up here, there's a lot of information, but under resources, there's a lot of tools for survivors, including talking about what a care plan is, um, how to take charge of your care, how to talk to your team, etc. The American Society of Clinical Oncology has a patient provider, a public website called CancerNet, and here's the screenshot of their survivorship page for survivors. So it really does cover a lot of this information. 
But again, it's knowing that this website exists and then knowing to look for survivorship information. And then this is based on a lot of the ASCO information as well. This is a booklet from the NCCS, and I highly recommend it. It's, it's actually the booklet that helps people figure out what questions to ask, because they're listed here across the continuum. And it doesn't mean that everybody has to ask every single question, but it may be helpful before a visit to flip through and write down the questions that the person wants to ask. And it may help trigger that. The other is that people really should be encouraged to write down the questions they have and bring somebody else with them or a tape recorder or a notebook or something to keep track of this information because I had, I had one, cu one couple um, talk about that the only way they remember what happened was when they checked out and they got a receipt for the bill they paid. It said when their next appointment was, but basically everything else they forgot. And so we really have to think about how do we do this in writing and make sure that people have what they need. The National Cancer Institute, they have the Office of Cancer Survivorship, which was established in 1996. They have a number of resources um, that I would encourage you to look forward to, including either obtaining or downloading the booklets, Life After Cancer Treatment, um, and Moving Beyond Cancer, um, and, and that there is much more detailed information um, from this page to help people. The American Cancer Society also has some wonderful survivorship information. Again, you can go on their website and either get patient-related educational materials or get their latest guidelines um, and recommendations. Um, there's a number of other resources the, um, for providers or for people who want to learn more. I have them on the slides. I won't talk about each one of them. But there's actually um, this e-learning series for primary care providers. And then there's a website for primary care providers that a physician I know from Harvard has developed where she puts links to all the relevant things there. I actually include those two links at the bottom of the survivorship care plans I de develop and deliver so that when the primary care provider gets it, at least they, you're giving them some resources that may be very helpful. Um, and you may want to go on and explore that as well. Um, and another plug, if you haven't seen it, um, ASCO is going to be doing a joint um, cancer survivorship symposium between primary care providers and oncology providers in January in San Francisco that's being co-sponsored by the American Academy of Family Physicians, the American College of Physicians, and ASCO. And I think we're going to be needing to see more and more of those because we really need to learn how to speak each other's language and talk about our concerns in delivering cancer survivorship care. So on my, some, this last picture, I think, is a wonderful quilt that gets the whole point of this talk, which is when life is sewn back together, it's changed. And you often hear survivors talk about life before cancer and life after cancer. And life after cancer does not usually look exactly the same as it did before cancer. It's been changed in some ways, some ways for the better, and some ways not. And I think our role as providers and as advocates is to help people put it back together as best they can um, for what they've been through. I've been talking for quite a long time, and I'm hoping to open it up now for questions or comments or discussions, and I'm going to turn this over to Eric um, to to help allow questions to be submitted. Thank, thank you. you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Deb. We will now have our question and answer segment of the webcast. If you would like to ask a question, simply type your question into the chat box area located on the lower left corner of your screen. Once you have entered your question, click on the send button located next to the box. Your questions will not be viewable by other attendees. You can also ask a question through the phone if you are dialed in. To ask a question, simply select star 1 on your telephone keypad now. Please note that star 1 will not work if you are using a speakerphone. Please pick up the handset before selecting star 1. If you are waiting to ask a question and you decide you no longer wish to ask that question, select star 2 to remove yourself from the phone queue. Shelley, we're ready for our first question. 
Great. Um, for, first, I just want to thank you, Dr. Mayer, for that excellent presentation. I know I was taking a lot of notes. I have a lot of questions, but I don't want to take up the time with my questions, um, so we'll definitely go to our audience for questions. But I just also want to say um, thank you for all the lovely images you included. I swear we didn't pay her to include all these um, great images from Lily Oncology on Canvas, but I think you did such a nice job of integrating them into the message and um, into your presentation, so we really appreciate that. So first I have a question um, from the text, and then we'll go to see if there's anybody ha who has questions on the phone. Um, but Nancy asks, what type of tool do you recommend for identifying unmet needs? Well, there's, there's two levels of that question. One is um, your system needs, so that the Commission on Cancer requires that you do some type of needs assessment of your population at least every three years. And so that can help drive your program development um, based on what your population and community are saying are their unmet needs. And um, people do homegrown surveys or what have you. There's been a number of groups um, that have used the CASUN, C-A-S-U-N, as an instrument um, for doing that kind of needs assessment. And if you go to beta gem at NCI, I think if you just Google it, you'll get to the white website. They have a lot of these instruments and measures on that website. So you can develop your own. You can use some established measures, or you can use a mixture of them, depending on how big of a group you're trying to sample. For individual patients, as they're coming back for follow-up, one, one aspect is you know using the distress screening tool not just the number on the thermometer, but the items on the right of the distress screening school tool has a number of those issues identified. So you can use that as a simple checkoff in why they're waiting. Um, so a lot of people use just some kind of um, uh, self-reported, patient-reported um, list while they're waiting to bring into the visit with them. Um, we use, uh, we're trying to use more um, more systematic questions, and that's a whole area of patient-reported outcome assessments that's going on right now. So I'm not sure that there's a magical answer. Some people use the MSAS or the ESAS. Some people use other kinds of tools. But I would encourage you to go look at the beta gem or the NCSCN distress tool and then just use that as a screener. Okay, thank you. So here's another question, and then we'll go to the phones. Um, so from Stacy, are there any evidence-based strategies for reaching diverse and underserved populations with survivorship information and resources? That's a really good question, and um, I'm not an expert in this, but um, one is when you look at what you're asking and what you're doing as far as resources are available, you need to keep that audience in mind. For, so for example, if you're developing all web-based resources and people don't have access to the internet, you're missing out on a large population. The same thing goes for reading levels um, of materials that you use that you need to be really sensitive to, um, as well as cultural adaptations, whether you have a largely Hispanic population or other groups that you're working with, depending on your area. Um, strategies to reach them. It depends on where you're living and how you're doing. Like I work with a lot of researchers who do work in this area, and a lot of them do things like going into the community, working with church groups, um, and trying to do other, other working with peer-to-peer -peer counseling with other survivors, um, or partnering with other organizations in your community to do that. I don't know that if there's a magical answer. I think the most important part of that is that you actually remain sensitive to the fact that there are people out there who may not have easy access to what you have to offer. OK, thank you. I'm going to ask Jessica if we have any calls in the queue on the phone. There are no questions in the queue at this time. OK, um, well, I'm going to ask a question then, but please feel free if you have any questions to hit star one on your phone if you want to get into the queue. Um, but I'm, Deb, I appreciated what you, you said about the care plan up front being a key mm -hmm. component and talking about 
the bookends. And, you know, that's something that is obviously very important to us. And I'm just wondering if you have suggestions for strategies to improve the adoption of those care plans up front, because I do believe that's what patients really want, um, to, to really help, um, you know, make this experience a little bit more understandable to have their diagnosis and treatment on paper. Um, so how do, we, how do we encourage providers to do that, and how have you been able to do that at your institution? Well, I haven't yet, but I'm hoping to. <laughs> so I don't want to say that I have all the answers or that we're doing it perfectly. I, you know, I've been on the survivorship committee for ASCO, and some of the work is coming out of that. And we did all the work about revising the survivorship care plan to make them more patient-centered and primary care provider-centered. And that's the new templates that have been released on ASCO's website, but it's also the elements that the Commission on Cancer have adopted as being the minimum elements that should be included. That's for the survivorship care plan, because we ask the question is, why does it matter that the patient know their BSA 10 years after they've gotten a drug? So we, we took out about 80% of the content of material that was in the original ones, which were well intended and were hope that were, you know, I think it was the intent that a lot of people would use them for research purposes, et cetera, but it made it so difficult that very few people were actually doing that. We're hoping that by keeping it simpler and cleaner, it'll be easier to do, and I'm happy to talk about how we're trying to implement survivorship care plans at our institution electronically. But we're, what we're also doing then is um, the original forms from ASCO, half of the paper was a treatment plan, and the other half was the, the survivor's care plan about um, what, what was going on. That also adds the confusion of the form. So we have actually just finished creating a treatment plan template that looks very similar to the survivors of care plan template, except it's about at time of diagnosis. And we're in the process of sending it out for review, and we will be posting it available on the ASCA website. And then we're going to be meeting and discussing about how to disseminate that. I don't think it's going to turn into another Commission on Cancer standard, which is probably a good thing because people are sort of overwhelmed with trying to meet all the distress screening guidelines and the care plan guidelines. But I would like ner oncology nurses, nurse navigators, social workers, and others to own this so that when a patient has met with their cancer team and have decided about a treatment, is to make sure that the patient does not walk out of that visit without a written treatment plan using that template or a similar form and, and or to embed it in their electronic health record so that we can give that to them on the way out of their initial treatment or by the second visit. And then the survivors of care plan will be the other bookend. So that's the next charge that we're going to be trying to lead. And we'll make that available, and when it does, what I'm hoping we'll do is work with every advocate group, including the National Coalition for Cancer Survivorship, to make the template available and to have that one of the, patient, the questions that patients and family members are encouraged to ask, can I have a written treatment plan? So we'll see if that happens. I'm hoping that before I retire, that becomes a standard of care. Um, we'll see if it does. <laughs> Are you retiring anytime soon? Because then we have some urgency to make that happen. <laughs> well, soon enough. I mean, you know, in the next five or ten years, but it may take that long to do it. Uh, unfortunately, but um, that sounds great, and we look forward to working with you on that. Um, yeah. I have a really quick question from an audience member who asked if you could spell the name of the resource uh, that you were talking about. Was it beta gen? We just want to. She just wants to yeah, make sure she me. can. Let me see if I can Google it. Are you seeing my screen right now? No. No. Okay, let, let me just pull it up myself and I'll tell you. Okay, it's www.gem, G-E-M, hyphen, beta, B-E-T-A, dot org. Great, the other thank you. Web, that's, that's one way. And then the other website that you can go to to get to it is can't cancercontrol.cancer.gov forward slash BRP forward slash GEM, G-E-M, dot HTML. That's cancercontrol.cancer.gov forward slash BRP forward slash G 
gem.html. And what you'll do is if you go to the, the gembeta.org website, it takes you to, if you click on the cancer in the left-hand column, it takes you the measures and constructs. And, and so you can look at all the different ones that are available there. Um, and it's getting more robust every day. So I think it's really a great resource. Great, thank you. And if we if we can we can put that in the email we send out with the link to the um, for feedback on the on the webinar, so people will have that. And also, um, we had a comment from Kathy in uh, Minnesota that said that they wrote a care plan for patients in Minnesota, and it's and it's posted on the American Cancer Society website. She said one way to drive change is patient demand, and empowering them is a start. And so we agree with that. That's not, that's great. We'll we'll uh, look for that link and also mm -hmm. put it in when we send out follow up. There's nothing so magical we, about the form. So just let me just say, right. there are many people, there's Journey Forward, there's other um, uh, tech companies that are trying to embed this into electronic health records, there's homegrown forms. It, it doesn't matter which one you use as long as it meets your patient's needs as far as comprehension and includes the content that's important to them. Right. So here's a question from Rhonda. She asks, how can a nurse practitioner heading a new survivorship program help the oncologist refer their stage zero and one breast cancer patients to the program? That's a good question, Rhonda. And, and, and that raises the whole question of how do you get any patients referred to getting this information. So one is um, some places are developing independent survivorship clinics where patients are getting referred. Others are embedding it into their care where they're receiving it. So there are different models of how to do that. One is um, what I have tried to do is embed myself. Now, I see breast cancer patients in follow-up because I, I'm also teaching and do research. I only see patients a half a day a week, and I thought that that would be the most relevant way. And what I did is I embedded myself with the back breast group and started seeing sort of the overflow patients or the follow-up patients and then started with um, a follow-up clinic. And so I can see patients one time for what I call a transition clinic visit, which I sit down and give them, create and give them their survivorship care plan and then talk about the health promotion and counseling, et cetera, et cetera. Or I can be part of the team that does the follow-up surveillance. So really, you need to think about your model of care. And then you just need to start slowly and every time you see a patient, you ask them to tell their doctors how much they appreciated that visit. And the peer pressure from patients going back, they'll talk amongst themselves. Other people will ask for them. And then as providers hear how satisfied their patients are from having seen and dealt with all that, we'll start. It's, it's just diffusion of innovation. It's the early adopters. Once there's enough volume, you will get other people doing it just because they're hearing about it and there's peer pressure. So what I would do is I would call and make sure that you're getting a few patients and then you talk to those patients to make sure that other patients can have access to that kind of service by letting their providers know how happy they were to get it. So that's, it's slow and um, you're going to have people who are early adopters and providers who are going to have no resistance in sending their patients to you to do that. And there are going to be others who are going to hang on and not want to do that. Do not invest your energy in those people because that's going to drain you of the energy you need to bring in most of the other people. And eventually the peer pressure will affect on those who don't want to use the services initially. Eventually they'll come around. And that's just diffusion of innovation work. Great. Thank you. Um, so here's a question from Eve. She said that the population of survivors of pediatric cancers in adolescents and young adults will continue to grow. So how are their needs different medically, psychosocially, and for communication and support? Well, there, I'm not an expert in dealing with adolescent and young adults, although I have taken care of some young adults. What I would say is, they, we know from Institute of Medicine reports and from NCI, SEER statistics, that they do not fare as well as children who have had cancer. They sort of fall through the cracks of um, established pediatric programs and, and adult oncology programs. So they have unique needs in the sense that their 
burgeoning adults and all those developmental issues that may have been impacted by their cancer and its treatment. Um, it's also not clear where they should be seen or treated. And so big cancer centers may have unique clinics for adolescents and young adults with cancer. Others may transition them out of pediatrics into adult oncology or back just to primary care. So I think it really depends on the resources and the size and scope of the program that you have to offer. I know for many times, like I deal with younger women with breast cancer, that when they go to breast cancer support groups, they don't feel like it speaks to them because most of the women in those support groups are older. And so then I connect them with um, younger survival um, groups that are available online or in the community. The Stupid Cancer Group is one of them. There's a young um, breast cancer group, Young Coalition of Survivors. So there are groups meant for that population. So I would just make sure that they're hooked up with those resources and that it's a discussion of your program about how you're going to manage that population so that they don't get lost in the shuffle. Great, thank you very much. So Jessica, are there any questions in the phone queue? No, ma'am. Okay. Um, so I'm going to read this comment from Mel. Um, it's not a question, but I might uh, add on a question to it. Um, she said, thank you so much for presenting. As a cancer patient, it is very disconcerting to finish the current treatment and then just go home and be expected to return to life where you left off. And that is exactly what I have done. I deal with the pain, deal with the neuropathy, cognitive and balance issues in silence. Life is not the same and there needs to be more public awareness, not for sympathy, but for simple understanding. So <clears throat> I appreciate that comment and I, I think that it was it's very relevant. And, and one of the things I was wondering about as you were talking is you, you talked a little bit about, but I'd love to hear more about how can we better address the psychosocial needs of survivors through, through survivorship programs. Um, because I think Mel's comment, you know, hints at or really directly addresses some of the, you know, the isolation and the, the, the challenges of kind of living your new life that's not the same. I, I appreciate your comments, Mel, and I, I feel for them because I think what you've experienced, many people do, and I think we do a great disservice by not paying attention to that transition and for helping people. Um, so one is you, I, would, I would challenge you when you go for your surveillance checkups to raise those issues with your providers so that they're aware of them and ask about what kinds of resources or supports. Now, you may be diff living farther away from your cancer program or what have you. Many times there's a community resources. Like in my area, independent of the, the cancer programs that we have, we have an independent place called Cornucopia House that offers a lot of education and support groups for people with no cancer left over or with advanced cancer. And so our, our programs are supported in the community and offered in the community. Oftentimes there are online communities where you can hook up with other people with the type of cancer that you've had. Um, ACOR is one. You could go to the um, advocacy groups of the cancer that you have, and many times they offer online support groups. And oftentimes that's where you'll find other people like yourself. And that can be very comforting because your family may not be able to hear or understand what it is you're going through, or your coworkers or other people in your community, unlike other people who have been through this. And having done focus groups with other women with breast cancer, I can tell you that behind closed doors you can talk about things that nobody else would believe you could talk about amongst each other because you've all been there and been through that. And so I would hope that you find a group like that so you don't feel so isolated. And I think it's, it's hard, but many times you have to do that online to, to connect with the other people like yourself. Great, thank you. So here's a question from Lisa. How do you address people who had very rare cancers, like Burkitt's lymphoma? These are all very good questions, and I don't have magical answers for all of those things. Um, again, there's a um, NIH has the rare disease group, so um, there's that way. And then I don't know if there's a, for
for example, an advocacy group for people with Burkitt's lymphoma. So the so one of the things I might do is go to a bigger group like the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, where there might be people within that group that have Burkitt's lymphoma. So I would I would try and hook on to a bigger advocacy group that has a similar cancer. Um, that might be one way. And then, again, ACOR, which is the Association of Community. Let me just pull this up again to make sure I have it right. Um, the Association of Cancer Online Resources. If you have an unusual tumor or unusual situation, you are more likely to find it there. They have 142 online communities that are cancer related whether it's for caregivers or child care, cancer survivors or certain side effects or where you live, et cetera, et cetera. They have a number of communities, some more active than others. But if you go to ACOR, A-C-O-R dot org, you are most likely to find a group that you'll relate to. I mean, they have people with certain genetic dis um, problems that lead to cancer or cancer-related um, syndromes, etc. So that's another place that I would go to look. Thank you very much. So I have, um, I'm going to kind of paraphrase this question um, a little bit, but you talked about that we don't have enough data on long-term um, effects of treatment. So is there any effort to really kind of systematically collect um, the long-term information about the long-term effects, and then also to notify patients about that after you know after the fact, if they've been treated, and then we discover that there's a long-term effect that they need to know about ten or fifteen years later. Are you aware of any efforts like that? Uh, I'm not aware of efforts to contact people about their risk factors after the fact. I am aware of these cohort studies that are trying to track all of this, but again, there's too few that have been done, and hopefully we'll have more over time. Um, so we don't have good answers for that yet, and I am hoping that we fund more studies. The other thing that I think is going to be very helpful is the, the big data that we're going to be able to analyze out of electronic health records or other programs um, where we're collecting data on survivors or cancer treatment where we can look at the real world experiences, looking at claims data um, along with um, cancer data. So I think that's where health services research and looking at big data may be helpful to look at some of these things. But again, somebody's going to have to make the connection between that side effect and their previous treatment. And I'll give you an example. Somebody I know have been treated for Hodgkin's disease like 20 years ago, and they're now experiencing Raynaud's, which is a cardi um, uh, peripheral vascular problem where people's vessels um, get smaller so they, they feel cold and it compromises the blood flow to their hands or feet or what have you. And that's been associated with some of the drugs that were used to treat Hodgkin's disease. Now, if a primary care provider is seeing a patient and they're getting Raynaud's, they may not ever make that connection back to their Hodgkin's disease and its treatment. So I'm not quite sure how we're going to track all of that, but I think there's a bunch of researchers trying to look at that, looking at long-term claims data and problems that people are having. But it's going to take large numbers of long-term survivors to do that. And we're only now getting into large enough groups 15 and 20 years out to ask some of those questions. Great, thank you. Um, I know that's really uh, disconcerting for people who have to deal with these late and long-term effects, but I, I am hopeful that you know some of these efforts will give us some more of the information that we need. The other, the other part that I would like to say about that is people who are experiencing them can educate us about that. And I right. think that the power of the story of individuals who are having these problems are, will go far to educate their providers who will then think about it more. So if we can't help you, you can help us learn more about it. And, and over time, that may lead to other research or a better understanding of how this works. 
Yeah, that's really important. Well, I think that is all the questions that we have, and I, what we will end a couple of minutes early, but I want to thank you so much, Dr. Mayer. This has been really, really informative, and you were extremely well prepared, and thank you so much for your time and, and effort. And thank you to all of you who participated in the webinar, and we will follow up with a, with a brief questionnaire just to get some feedback on the webinar, and we will provide the links that were mentioned um, by Dr. Mayer. Um, so thank you very much for participating, and we look forward to uh, talking with you on our next webinar in May. Thank you for having me. And I do pardon the interruption, but there is a question in the phone queue. Oh, great. Paul, please state your name before you pose your question. My name is Yolanda. Uh my name is Yolanda Aline. I'd like to know if a survivor would like to sign up for the long-term study, how would they go about it? If you would, you would talk to your cancer doctors to see if there's a study available at your institution. And if there's not, um, there's a website you can go to called clinicaltrials.gov, and that will let you know who's doing what studies. Somebody may have, you may want to go to work with a librarian to figure out how to search for this because it can get sort of overwhelming. But you can look up studies and then contact the person running the study to ask about participating. Okay, thank you very much. And you were very informative. I really enjoyed you. Thank you, and thank you for joining us. Great. Well, I'm glad we could get at least one uh, phone question in. And thank you again for, for your presentation and to all of you for participating. Thank you. Have a good afternoon, everyone. This does conclude today's conference. Thank you for your participation.